I decided to go ahead and write about him before he became the character she wrote about later, so prequels, basically. And what I love about it is that she's given him so many teen emotions. And I think that that's really key to where we're finding balance between our protagonists, our, you know, a gender balance between our protagonists. That, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that because we're gonna talk about the hero's journey as it's been um, taught to us and how it's uh, the monomyth feeds into our quests and our hero's journeys and, and the fantasy and the science fiction that we uh, read today and I think that we're coming to read in favor. So I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna go ahead and get started because, well, everybody's here, so. <laughs> we pretty, pretty much have already started. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we're, we're already rolling. So, hello everyone, welcome to Emerald City Comic Con. Uh, my name is Bob Nelson, I am the publisher of Brick K Books, uh, whose authors are here today uh, to talk about the Hero's Journey, fictional literature with a female protagonist. Um, I do have a couple of housekeeping items. If you do have your cell phones, please set them to stun. And um, we will be clearing the room at the conclusion of the panel, and they are asking us to leave through the back of the room. So that door right there in the middle, that'll be the door that we exit through so that they can then bring people in through the side door. So um, what other housekeeping items do I have? Uh, nope, that's about it. So. Today, um, I have two authors to share their experiences with you, not just about uh, female heroes in general, but writing female heroes, the experience of the differences, the challenges, uh, which I think some of you have already kind of been touching on. You are welcome if you want. You are welcome to use the microphone in the center of the room if you want to queue up to ask a question. Um, otherwise, I, you know, it's not a big crowd, so I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. If you just kind of want to raise your hand, I'll kind of indicate when, it, when we're ready to take that question. We're going to start off, I'm going to introduce our panelists, or actually I'll let them introduce themselves, and then we'll go ahead and just kind of let them take over. So, Sharon? Oh. Uh, my name is Sharon Skinner, and I am a Rick Cave author. I've been writing for a number of years. I started writing novels in 1995. These are my three published novels at this time. I'm very, very happy. This is my new book. Fresh out, two <laughs> weeks ago, hands in hands. So uh, Mirabelle is getting quite a good launch, and I'm very pleased with that. So. Thanks for being here. Hello. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's your turn. I'm uh, Jen Zeep. Yeah, it's pronounced Zeep, C Z. Um, and I'm new Brick Cave author, and this is on. It is on. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and and I write. June 5th at a, at a <laughs> comic convention that we won't mention the name of. That has been laid upon my shoulders. <laughs> so, yeah, that's. She's also the author of a book prior to Brickade picking her up called Blackstrap's Ecstasy, which is a book about pirates. Um, and it is available nationwide and electronically. It's well. not just about pirates, it's about a very strong female there captain. Go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to um, I'm gonna go ahead and kick off the panel. I'm going to have Sharon, uh, if you would, I'm going to have you talk a little bit about the hero's journey maybe for people that aren't quite as familiar with it. And then we'll go ahead and, and I'm, I kind of want to open it up and let, let the discussion just carry itself. So. Okay, I'm a really big fan of Joseph Campbell's original monomyth uh, Hero of a Thousand Faces, his idea of the hero's journey and the way that it feeds into our need for story and the way that we tell story and how we, we come to story and relate to story and how it, it helps us to learn and grow. However, um, Joseph Campbell was writing as a man in a period of time where most of our heroes were now male heroes. They, they, there was a gender bias, like there's not anymore. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, his idea of the hero's journey was that, of course, there are some very specific components to this journey. And one is that you get the call to adventure, and that takes you out of your uh, comfort zone when you decide to answer, which sometimes heroes don't always decide right away, but they then maybe get thrown into it. 
and at some point you go out of your normal environment into a new realm, uh, a strange environment, a different place. So you go into the mythical realm. And you have adventures, and you have helpers, and there are all these little, I'm not going to go into all the real specifics. If you guys really want to do this, I really recommend um, Vogler's The Writer's Journey. Uh, so uh, if you're uh, writing The Hero's Journey, it's really good examples. But then at some point, you uh, kind of capture the flag. You go down and underneath into the darkness, you capture the flag, you come back, and you bring something back to your community. Okay? So those are kind of the, the key pieces, the, the cycle for a hero's journey. And at one point, shortly after he came out with the hero's journey, there was a, a woman who wrote a book called The Heroine's Journey. And her uh, basic premise was that the, the female hero's journey was internal. It was more of an internal, back to your, you know, comment about the emotional aspects. It was more of an emotional journey, you know. She didn't necessarily set out on an adventure. Um, and um, that's all well and good for maybe back when, at the time when she was really kind of pontificating on this, but I never bought into it. To me, a hero's journey needs both the masculine and the feminine perspectives. You need both sides of your brain. We all have a little bit of both in us. And the more balanced a hero's journey is for me, the more satisfying it is. So my female heroes do have a character arc, and that's the part that I talk about, the internal journey. That's what I would call the internal journey. But they also have external journeys. They actually go out on quests. They go out on missions. They do things. But they're not superheroes. They're real, but they're real, fairly normal people, except for maybe Karen. <laughs> but she's not a superhero. She just has some talents. Um, so for me, the most satisfying of the hero's journeys are those journeys that encompass both the internal and the external, which is why when you said earlier, uh, character arc, you, if you don't see it, you don't want to stick with it, right? So. so let me take a quick poll of the room. How many of you are writers? I'll ask that first. Okay. Oh, my. <laughs> How many of you have written or are writing something with a, a female protagonist? <laughs> so, um, Jen, I'm going to ask a question of you right now. Um, Blackstrap is a female captain pirate in a time not necessarily known for female captain pirates. Well, that's, that's kind of obscure history there, because that's just, that's... Talk it. <laughs> One of the most famous pirates ever known was a female was she pirate. Was she was... I mean, there's so many, I don't, yes, okay, many people think like Bob here, you know, that pirate, piracy was all men, and that's not the case at all. In fact, it was one of the first very much female entrepreneur choices. <laughs> this is business, you know, and women, women know business. Women know how to run a household, women know business. So if um, these women, they, during that time period, during the golden age of piracy, they were not allowed to own businesses. They were not allowed to, you know, have any kind of real rank in society. So, unless they married into it, and a lot of women still had the uh, the skills. They definitely had the skills to do this stuff. So, piracy was kind of the option to go to to say, "Well, I'm going to start my own business," and that just so happens that these are this is going to be my venue of choice. So, I mean, yeah, it's not. You were already breaking the law if you had a business, right? right? You are so already breaking the law if you had a business. Might as well just go and do yeah, it. If you're going to get in trouble for something, you'll get in trouble for something. Oh, <laughs> in for a guy, in for a dollar. Right. Anyway, anybody, anybody? Anybody? Because i got tons of them. <laughs> you guys don't want to get out there. I've got tons of them. All right. Um, Sharon, Kira comes from a very specific effort that you made uh, in examining the feminine hero. Talk a little bit about that and kind of what that process meant. Well, first let's talk about the fact that all of my characters really stem from the voices in my head. And you guys are writers, so you get that. Um, yeah, and if I don't write them down, then we have problems. So um, Kira came to me just as a character who I decided to follow around. I'm sort of a pantser when it comes to writing. I'm not a plotter. 
Uh, typically, I follow my characters around like a journalist, and I write down what they do. And I'll sit down at the computer and think, well, here we go. We're going off to the forest today, and they'll take a left turn, and it's like, what the heck? All right. All right. <laughs> That's not where I was planning to go. go that way. All right. <laughs> just messed me up. But, um, but uh, one of the things that I talked about a little bit earlier when we were just chatting was how my stories are very layered. You can come to my books and read them as just a story. It's just a story, and it's a good story. It's got a satisfying conclusion, and it's got nice characters, and they have a arc in the A. But you can read a little deeper into most of my stories, and here's a book. The Healer's Legacy is one of those books because one of the things I examine in this book is uh, patriarchal norming from the perspective of three different women. Uh, Kira, who tends to be outside the zone a bit, and also uh, a couple of other characters uh, who are in the established uh, system, uh, patriarchal system, and how they navigate that system, and how Kira can have said that says that part just a little bit. So uh, there's some deeper meaning in my books, and I actually, believe it or not, I have a master's in creative writing. Yeah, yeah I'm one of those guys. Um, and I actually used, um, for my thesis, I used Kira's story, and I talked about using fantasy and science fiction as resistant text for young people. I don't know if you know what that means, but um, if you're in a scholarly way, yes, you'll know. But resistant text basically is anything that pushes back against the social messaging that we're getting. So the, so the social messaging that we're getting still tends to be that women are more ob objectified, women uh, need to be a specific look, a specific act, a specific way. We still have a lot of that, um, especially when I wrote the first draft of this book, which was in 2006. Um, so it's a pushback on that. By examining that patriarchal norming, you can look at that as resistant text. And it gives young women a place to go. Um, going off of that resistive text kind of idea, when you guys started writing um, like professionally, a lot of what you would have been reading was probably male-based because the publishing world is very patriarchal. Um, and the, did that make it difficult for you at all to get inside the minds of your female characters since that's not what you're used to reading? I, when I started writing, I was reading stuff that was very much, you know, kind of a balance, really. I started, you know, when I think this first real big wave of powerful female fantasy characters was coming in, especially with, you know, the, I mean, we're just talking about Patricia Lee um, with the with dragons, and, and there's just, I don't know, I didn't really feel that way. I felt like, you know, it was something that I could do. And also, even reading male characters, you can relate to them in that sense of, you know, and I, I grew up kind of with them. <laughs> well, and I'm, I'm a little older than you, so um, yeah, I'm going to answer that question by saying I read a lot of Heinlein, I read a lot of Asimov, I read a lot, you know, of that stuff when I was younger, and that's very patriarchal based. It's very biased. It, you know, women should have been dressed in paint only, and you know that sort of. Thing. Um, it was very much male fantasy science fiction. It really was. The literature was was designed for that, and um, it didn't hurt me any. But I don't think that um, it clued me in enough when I wrote my first version of this book. This book was published second, but it was actually drafted first. Uh, when I wrote the first version of this book, I made the mistake of not empowering my female protagonist enough at the end. So first draft, I got done, I looked at it, and I went, wow, I just fell into the trap. Because it's very easy to fall into that rescue the the female protagonist trap when you're first writing, especially if what you've been fed all your life is exactly what you say, the fairy tales and, the, and, and all of that. But um, I also read very voraciously and very eclectically, and so there are a lot of very strong uh, female characters out there to read. Uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley, uh, uh, just to name a few, um, and now we've got, um, well, Cassandra Clare, 
writing uh, <coughs> what I think are strong female uh, characters. Also, um, who writes the Mercy Thompson stuff? Uh, Patricia Briggs. Uh, yeah, so uh, there's a, there are a lot of very strong female characters out there now. To, to But I also still read male characters, like the Nick Fury stuff. Um, what am I reading now? Um, has anybody read the Anna Dressed in Blood? Uh, oh, the Kinder. Yeah, Kinder Blake. Right okay, so it's a male protagonist, but he, but there's also a very strong female character in there in the form of a ghost. So and she's like really powerful, and it's almost her story at the end of the first book. So I think we're starting to see a lot more balance. This particular book, The Nelling Stones, has actually a male and a female protagonist in it. And I'm getting really deep reviews from 10 and 11 year old boys for this book, even though the main protagonist really is the female, and it starts with her. It ends with them both, but it starts with her. And it doesn't seem to matter, which is really exciting for me. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Can we go to the back of the room? Um, for Jen, when you were doing research for Blackstrap, um, did you have a difficult time um, researching women pirates? Because uh, so much of it is men everywhere. everywhere. Um, <laughs> yes and no. Um, I found, you know, everybody knows Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, and, and those those are the names that were really big. That's very Western pirate stuff. It was when I got into the Eastern pirates that I found a lot more information, and really, that's what I flew with. But I also have a really great friend uh, who has her master's degree, or no, I'm sorry, her, her PhD in pirate history. And <laughs> <laughs> a very useful degree. It's such a useful degree, at least for me. And so I kind of have her on, on speed dial, so whenever I'm in trouble, where I'm like, I'm going here. This is what I'm writing. This is what I'm doing. Am I OK with this? <laughs> she, she's like, oh, yeah, you're fine. Keep going. And I'm like, all right, good. Because I find that most of the really crazy stuff that I have my, my female pirates do, it, it's not that crazy compared to history. I mean, some of these women were just unbelievable. They're stranger than fiction, truly. I, I mean, I was really impressed with uh, the women who did not hide the fact that they were female. And they got on these ships and they just said, this is how it's going down, and I'm, I'm the boss now. Or they would actually kill the former captain, and which is how piracy works. You know? it, it's, very, it's very diplomatic until you just kill the guy who was <laughs> against you in, in the running. So it, it's really good politics. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. So what? constitutes a strong female character. If two people get into an argument, like what kind of arguments would you use to prove or disprove that sort of thing? You know, specific character? I think that, um, first of all, a strong a strong female character isn't that different than her male count counterpart, really. I think that uh, it's a person who owns their own destiny in many ways by the end of the book. Now, maybe not in the beginning. They may fight it in the beginning. They may um, not want to own their own destiny. They may not want to own their powers. Buffy certainly didn't want to own her. You know, she didn't want to be a vampire. She wanted to be a cheerleader for crying out loud. You know, um, go Buffy. Uh, but, but there's nothing wrong with wanting to be a cheerleader too. Yeah, and she, she did manage to pull it off for a little while, except for you know when some of the cheerleaders went up in flames. <laughs> But uh, I think they have to own it, they have to, and they have to be willing to own it. I think that the important thing for me as a writer is to write a character that can be tempered through the fires of the challenges that they face. So one of the things that has to happen is that your character needs to start at a place, in my, in my opinion, the character needs to start in a place where they have room to grow and become that character that they need to be at the end of the book. They need to have what they have to be able to grow and do that, but they need to be tempered by the fires of all of the obstacles that they have to deal with by the antagonists, by anything that stands in their way. And that tempering is what makes them the instrument 
uh, that, can, that can own their own destiny by the end of the journey. And that's really what needs to happen. And I don't care if it's a male protagonist or a female protagonist or co-protagonist. For me, that's true story. That's really satisfying. That's who I can connect with. Somebody who can learn to grow into what they need to be by the end of the story. Thank you. Me? Yep. How do um, both of you feel about the stereotype that in order to be a strong female protagonist, you have to be masculine? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just yeah, roll. say some shit? <laughs> 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 um, I, yeah, I don't think that's the case at all, though. I mean, when, yeah, that, it's bullshit. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to go with that. Uh, because it is. I, I think that. Okay, well, everybody's all in the Game of Thrones now, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, I, I mean, yeah, we gotta be in the Game of Thrones. So. <laughs> okay, so, um, the female, the strong female characters in that are strong in, like, every way a female character can be strong. Even Cersei, we, we all love to hate her, um, she's, she's a strong character. She is truly that strong maternal character. She's doing everything she can for her kids even if it means killing everybody else off, you know I mean? But, but she means it, and that to me is strength in that very nurturing place of motherhood. And, and I'm the same way, you know, with my kids. You mess with my kids, you're gonna bring out the bear in me. It's just, that's the way it is. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a strength that I think women kind of hold. I guess I should've put a likable in there. Oh, people, okay. oh. It's that people, if a strong female protagonist isn't masculine and exhibiting masculine strength, people tend to hate her and call her like bitchy and say that she's catty and not as good as this other female who's masculine. Yeah. Well, and isn't that a lot of the, uh, isn't that a lot of the credit uh, for Sansa? She's yeah, so everybody good. hates Sansa, but if you look at Sansa, she's a really strong character. She it's is. just that yeah. she's a young girl Daenerys who's going on a different journey than, Tart. you know, yeah, Arya. She's trying to work things out in her own way, and she's trying to fit in to society's rules, and she's kind of playing the cards that she's been dealt in the best way that she can, and I, you know, she's doing a good job. When you talk about, when you talk about female characters who are, um, a product of their environment and they're working that environment, manipulating it, if, if you will, um, finding their way, things like that. They can still be strong characters. They can be very disliked. Um, but I think that, um, oh gosh, there was this series of books and I can't remember what they were. Big epic series and one of the female characters was a dancer. She was also an assassin. And she was really good at both. <laughs> and I really, I just thought that was such a well-drawn character. Now, she wasn't the primary protagonist, but she was one of the party of protagonists that traveled around and, you know, kind of, I, I wish I could remember the name of the series. It's been more than a decade since I read that one. So I'm aging myself a bit. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with being a dancing girl and being good with swords. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm waiting. I've got one more here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned antagonists uh, a minute ago, and typically when you're talking about resistant texts, how do you balance that without having them just be sort of like a mouthpiece for society, like giving them depth as well? Like, have you written uh, female antagonists, and how do you balance that so you, they're, they're interesting and they're not just parroting the stuff you're resisting against? <laughs> we love them. We love to hate them. One of the best compliments I get from this book is when people come up to me and they say, God, I hated that woman. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you. <laughs> I hated her when I wrote her. And, 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 and I'm glad that that has come through. But uh, I have a female character in this book like that. And she's a product of her environment. She's trying to, she's doing what she thinks she needs to do to make her way in the world. And to protect her children and their and the legacy that um, that she wants to leave behind for them, and but people hate her. Well, yeah, I disliked her too, but it's, it's a really high compliment to me to to know that she was real enough, and that's what you're talking about. What you're talking about is writing an antagonist that's real enough for people to say, God, I 
I know somebody just like that. And I really hate her too, you know? Um, and I think that's the key. As long as you keep it real and, and, and make sure that they are fully faceted individuals that, and that they have those moments. Your antagonist can't all be bad. I mean, my bad guy in this book, he really, really, really wants to have a pet bird real bad, but he's a dragon and he scares them all. So, but he really, really wants to have, you know, so your antagonist can't, they can, like, they can be all bad, but if they're too all, all bad, they can come across very flat and not real. And you want them to be real. They do want them to be relatable. Does that make sense? Um, so someone mentioned Santa and Santa together when we were talking about strong female characters in Game of Thrones. And one thing I noticed about her specifically is she's a very little agency. Um, everything she does is kind of directed by outside forces. So can you write a character who is still strong in themselves even when like all of their choices are made by other people? So can I throw a quick poll out there real quick? Just yeah. How many of you guys think that in the hero's journey in uh, the Harry Potter series was Harry Potter? How many of you think the hero's journey was Hermione's? Uh huh. There, there's your answer. <laughs> well, you know, um, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to my example here, Healer's Legacy. You know, I've done. I think I've done that. And I think I've done that really well with that particular character. You still don't like her. She's an antagonist. You're not supposed to like her. So, um, but. Yeah, I think it can be done. I think that there are people who do it very well. Um, yeah, but you gotta work at it, you gotta make them real. And again, it's like, who is whose journey really is it? You know, sometimes we don't always know. Me? Yep. Um, this is a two-part question. So you've kind of talked around this, but what typically do male authors get wrong from a female perspective? Um, about female protagonists. And our second part is, can you think of any male authors that get it right? <laughs> right there. But he, all, he gets it all right. You know, I mean, Joss Whedon, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I aspire. Uh, you know, I think that nowadays we're seeing more male authors who are getting it more right. Um, if you want to go back, uh, back, back, or if you want to look at comics, comics is a real challenge, area of opportunity for, for uh, writers. Um, they're not getting it right. Uh, <coughs> That's the one. Sorry. C.S. Lewis totally screwed up in his Paralander series. Anybody ever read the Paralander series? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my god, it's horrible. Like, I seriously couldn't even read the last book. Because there, there is a, a phrase in the book, and I can't, I'm, I'm going to misquote it, but essentially the, the seed of it was, okay, now because I'm becoming a real woman, I can give up all of my other frivolous dreams and settle down and become a good mother. <laughs> I'm like, you know, that's cool to have that as well, but I read that and I was done. I'm like, I'm done. I, I can't do this anymore. I, and it had so much potential to be a good series because of the science fiction you know, and all this stuff. You know who does a great job? Garth Nix. Sabriel? Yes. Come on, people. That is yes. amazing stuff. And she is an incredible protagonist who uh, picks up where her father has left off in the, I guess it's become a family business. I, I don't know, you know, sending the dead to where they go. I, uh, it's an interesting concept. But Garth Nix um, with Sabriel has done an amazing job, I would say, um, if you want a good example. Thank you. Anybody else got good examples? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go to the back of the room. Um, I have a question uh, for both of you, actually. Do you find it harder writing internal strength or external strength? For like Sansa and Brienne of Tarth, it's really internal for themselves. What are they doing to survive? And I'm not sure if you've read like the Codex of Valeria for, um, oh crap, I'm blanking on her name. 
um, but somebody who's really going out there like a uh, female assassin or something like that where it's really in your face, shove, murderous, violent. Yeah, here. Yeah. Um. <laughs> um, well, that's a good question. I actually, again, I will go back to say I love balance. And I love the balance of the intern internal and the external journey. I want my characters to be fully rounded. I want them to have a character arc. I want them to grow. I want, But I want them to also gain the tools and the expertise that they need to uh, become that instrument that they need to be by the end of the book. And sometimes that means learning to sword fight. And sometimes that means learning how to um, Use a nurture. magical bell to pin a demon on the other side of the how, seventh yeah, bit. Bring, bring bell. the right bells in the right <laughs> order. I mean, you know, it's whatever the tool is, um, it, it's it's all a learning curve, right? So I, I think that, again, for me, the most satisfying, and there are a lot of people who write, who, who enjoy the Dungeons and Dragons kinds of adventures where you get a group of people and they, you know, you read the story and they just go off and they have their little adventure and none of them really have any internal stuff going on there. Or, and then there are people who really like that internal stuff, that, 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 that change and that you know, emotional, a roller coaster, if you will, to get to where you, you you need to be. Me, I like them both. I like a package. I want a package deal. I want some of both. I like that balance. Okay. Further? Um, I just wanted to add that um, I think going back to the previous question, Neil Gaiman does some really yes. nice female characters. Yeah. Especially oh, yeah. in the same way. Yes. Yeah. Neil Gaiman's a very good example. Um. Well, I've, got, I've actually got something to add on to that. <coughs> I think um, even though he was a little bit neat on the end of writing the book, I think Arthur Gold gets the, gets the female perspective very, very well done in this course of the nation. That's because oh, yeah. when I was reading it, I could hardly tell who was writing it. Anyway, my actual question. So you t we, we talk, we're talking a lot about resistant texts and how to make um, how to make a character relatable and uh, resist social norms and tropes. But we also talk about reading eclectically. So we know that we need to read all kinds of stuff like that to you know, get an idea of the things that we could or should be resisting. Can you think of some really good examples of things that we can read that are prime examples of the tropes that we should not follow? Like Isaac Asimov or Twilight. <laughs> <laughs> going to say it. What character arc? Yeah. <laughs> what character arc? I mean, was there, was there some character arc in there? I didn't see any character arc in there. But people love it, and people love it because it's escapist uh, fantasy more than that it's, um, for me, it was, yeah, no. First book, fine. Should have stopped there. I would have been okay with that, you know. And all the rest was like, oh, but um, so that's a prime example. Um, gosh, I hate to pick on her, but the host. Oh. Oh. Uh, whiny, whiny, didn't change. I don't know character. So uh, to me, that's what it seemed like. So again, this is a matter of taste. So let me tell you what I think about mentor texts. You read wide and you read voraciously and you read very eclectically because what you're looking for is how to do it right, how to do it well, and you're also looking for, oh my God, I don't ever want to do that. <laughs> so mentor texts are those books that you pick up and that you read and you say, I'm going to kind of pick this apart a little bit and decipher this, and, or, you're, or you get so sucked in to a point where you go, wow, how did the author do that? That was amazing. I got so sucked in, I forgot that I was trying to read this as a mentor text. And you want to go back and read those pages, and you want to see how they did it. The, the, if you were a painter, the first thing that you would learn is to copy the masters, okay? You would learn to copy the masters, and I don't mean, you know, literally for writing, copy the masters, because that's plagiarism, <laughs> and we don't do that. But when I was, um, when I got to the point in The Healer's Legacy where I needed to write a battle scene, right? I sat down at the computer and I went, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> uh, so I said, okay, so who have I read that does this and does this really well? Oh, George R. R. Martin, right? 
that's one. I picked up several, actually. And I went and I picked up several of their books and I went and I found the battle scenes and I looked at how they did it, not exactly the specific, the, you know, A, B, C, D, E, but how they pulled it off that made it real. You know, and in, in the case of Martin, he has a tendency to, to give you the eagle, uh, eagle view and then bring it in so that it becomes more personal. And he does a beautiful job with it. And so I wanted to copy that technique. So copy your techniques. Copy those brush strokes of the artists who have gone before you. Use what they've already learned to learn from. Same thing goes for if you read a book and it's like, oh my God, I have to throw it at the wall. It's so bad. Well, not if it's on your Kindle. But um, <laughs> that would be bad. But you know, if you get to that point in a book where it's just look at it and figure out why is it that I hate this so much or that it's just throwing me out of the narrative so badly that I just can't stick with this book and don't do that. Don't do that in your own writing. So that's, that's how I come to what I call mentor texts. But it's, you can read any flavor that you personally care for and use those mentor texts. You don't have to use the ones that I use. So uh, that's a really good question. So let me put it the way <coughs> that my brain works. I, if, have, has, have anybody in here ever taken those tests where it tests to see how, how masculine or feminine you are in your brain? Yeah. Anybody done that? Yeah. yeah, I'm like 49, 51. You know, I'm like right there. I'm right down the middle. So for me, when you're writing about, um, when you're writing character, it's all about how effeminate do you want a character to be, male or female, 
or how masculine do you want that character to be, male or female? So what, what do you view as those strengths and weaknesses that you want to give a character that fall along that range? Because we all fall on that range somewhere, some more on one side than the other, but we all fall on that range. So to me, it's not so much about gender as it is about our masculine, feminine uh, <coughs> sides of who we are. Does that make sense? Yes. I was just thinking, the reader is going to read it in their own way. I mean, I could, the the character, and this kind of goes to the, the character that you had that was, that was revealing themselves as bisexual, and I realized only after I had finished writing the, the Blackstrap novel, and um, some of the characters definitely kind of, they swing whichever way they want. They don't really have a, a gender bias in, in any way. In one of the characters in particular, the antagonist, she's it's about power for her. She she's <coughs> in the harem, but it's not because she particularly likes women in a sexual way. It's she has power over this. So and it's that's more and and in that case it was because in her society that was how you show you have power is you have this collection of people. And but if somebody, if I were to write that same character as male, it would be pretty basic, flat, typical kind of bad guy character who's got this hair of women. And when I wrote it with a female, um, it it still had that kind of okay, well, this, she's a bad guy because she's got all these you know, women collected underneath her. And yet, when somebody else read it, they clearly saw something. It is art, so you know some people will hang a picture up on the wall upside down because they didn't know it was painted the other way. Um, so people will come to your work and they will read into it because we all see the world through our own lenses, and so there is a certain amount of that that's going to, to happen. Um, as a writer, we hope that people will love the books, love the characters, you know, really get into it, get lost in the worlds. But if you're lost in the world and it, you know, you see it just a little bit different than I saw it when I wrote it, I'm okay with that because that's how you see the world. As for, uh, I want to go back to something Jen said real quick. Motivation. Motivation is huge, and human motivation is what drives us all. And so, if she has a female character who has a harem, and it's because of power, that's a very different thing than a male who may have a harem because, well, he's just a lusty old guy, you know? <laughs> so it's, you know, it's all about motivation. And um, you have to make sure that the motivation behind what your characters are doing are believable, reasonable, real. That's what makes them real characters. That's what makes them human for us. That's what makes us relate. There's one right here. Um. Okay, I'm not quite sure how to put this, but I was looking at those um, character tests to make sure your characters are, aren't like really cliche. Um, one of the aspects on there was talking about the um, sort of, I think they put it as generic rebellious princess syndrome. I want to know, what are your thoughts on that, and if someone, for example, wanted to write a story about a princess, how to pull away from something like that? Well, okay, for, uh, for me, so, okay, so you're talking um, Serene, and what, what's her name in uh, uh, Patricia Reed's books? Oh, like yeah, Simmerine. Right? Simmerine. Okay, Simmerine. Yeah, she's kind of your typical rebellious princess, but she's got mad skills. So mm -hmm. there are some differences, you know, that, that give her an edge. And, um, okay, what's a good example? Well, of? Ari is a good example of a rebellious princess, too. Uh -huh. But yeah. Okay, but um, what you need to do is take the trope and turn it on its ear, okay? So if you want to be original, you, you can take that cliche character, change something of drastically about that character, or give them some sort of completely different motivation, or some sort of mad skills, or, Huge character flaw because flaws. Yes, it's 
all about the flaws, really. Uh, the Achilles heel, we need to have those in our characters or they're not believable. Um, and to, you know, take that and switch it up. The other thing I want to say about that is character tests and character sheets and things like that are, are helpful tools. They can be really helpful tools. Don't let them run your life. Don't let them tell you how to write and how not to write because the only real rule to writing is that you need to write your heart out. I, I, I just can't tell you how much, I mean, you can go to school, you can, you know, can learn all the ins and outs, all the proper grammar, all the, you know, all the ways to write, all the cliche, all the, you know, everything that you're supposed to do, know the hero's journey in and out, but if you're not writing your heart out, if you don't enjoy spending time with your characters, if you just don't look forward to going and sitting down and going, I love her voice, I need to be with her tonight. Um, if you're not doing that with your characters, then you need to think, rethink what you're doing and maybe try and find that relationship. Call it date night with the character, if you will. Um, but don't let the tools get in the way of that, is what I'm saying. You know, the rules and the tools. Because the, everybody's got their rules, and you know, every book that you read will tell you how to do it. Well, that's how that author did it. But we're artists. So I'm um, up here. You, when you were talking earlier about Nick Fury and how you like you're defining the balance and kind of making the male characters more human and less strong, as a young man, I was always taught, you know, through these characters that to provide value to family and society, I need to be strong and to not have those emotions. If I'm being weak, I'm not good. Um, if you're having strong, stronger female characters, is it challenging writing likable male characters that don't exist? In the in the Black Shirt book, actually, and actually in Trolls too, the male and female characters really balance each other out, as well as they kind of have a balance in in them individually too. They, I mean, the difficulty wasn't really so much in making sure that they weren't like overpowering the female characters. If that's what you're kind of getting at, is that they're I, I didn't make them weaker just for the sake of the female character being stronger. Um, they just were stronger in different ways, and it, so it balanced them out. And as far as making them likable, I think again, if you add that depth to the character, if you add those flaws, if you add, if you have that again, we just keep saying over and over again <coughs> about being human. It's not about gender. <laughs> That'll be the takeaway of the day. The takeaway of the day. <laughs> but I think, yeah, you don't have, I don't think male characters necessarily are less likable if they're strong. Oh, or if they're not. Yeah. Or, it, or, if they're, or if they're weak. In, in that they, as long as they exhibit something about them that offers an assistance to the female character, or is, they're still, they're still growing. To me, if they're young, if they're weaker, there's there's got to be a strength in there somewhere that doesn't necessarily have to be a physical strength. You can have male characters that may be physically weaker but are mentally adept at something. So I don't I don't know that that's answering the question exactly, but it's I'll answer that question. Okay. <laughs> Sequel to the Healer's like Legacy it. is in process, and. Uh, Partly because a lot of people have been asking for it, and I need to get it done. Uh, partly because uh, there's a story there. Where did I stumble? I stumbled exactly where you were, where you just said. I stumbled mainly in allowing both of my characters now, because I'm following a male and a female character in this realm, to be their own people, whether they're traveling together or traveling apart. I stumbled a little because. I was worried that it would no longer be Kira's story. I stumbled a little bit because I didn't want her to have too much help because she needs to go through some more of that tempering because otherwise she's not following that character arc. But, you know, the first book arc, second book arc, if I have a third book, I want her to have a character arc in each story. I don't want it to end up being one of those Twilight things where she almost kind of sort of got it. No. 
<laughs> um, so yeah, I, st I, I struggled a little bit with that, figuring out who they would be together and how their strengths and their weaknesses would play off of one another. And I'm working on that now, but um, it took a while. I hope that answers. All the way to the back. Yep. Oh. I did have my hand up. I'm by now a little bit off topic, but I'd like <laughs> to get back to the uh, question of trans or uh, intersex characters. <coughs> or in some cases, aliens that do not have an identifiable, uh, <coughs> sorry, an identifiable sex. And I've produced a couple of these in my own writing, and I've always wound up with problems with them. And that is that they tend to become objects for the more traditional characters, who bounce a lot of their gender issues off of those characters. Um, I did that with one intersex uh, man now living her first year as a woman in a young adult story where a bunch of, a couple of other girls decide to teach her the girl rules and unfortunately it becomes their hero's journey as they realize just how stupid this is so then i had to go back to my intersex character and say okay what's her journey i thought it was going to be so obvious but partially but it, it's not necessarily and uh, also a long-term journey of this transition, that's going to be more than one book. So I don't know, in, in that situation, how do you come across that, say, even with a bisexual character, in that the problem becomes where the more traditional characters uh, are just bouncing their issues off of her? Not in my book. Um, in my book, because that is that person is my protagonist, and she's clearly my protagonist. She she's troubled by it because she already okay. So she's basically a werewolf. She's genetically a werewolf, though. She's it's one of those things where if you don't get bit, it, it you know it was passed down hereditarily. And she already doesn't feel like she fits in her own skin. And she's in a uh, small town where things are pretty standard. Social norming standards are pretty nor you know normalized uh, from for you know, but. So she already doesn't feel like she fits in her own skin, and now she's got this issue to deal with, too. And it's just one more thing that she struggles with. Because temper, 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 temper your, um, you know, put them through the fire. Uh, but um, I will say that um, for her, it's, it's her journey, and so I'm not having those issues for her. But I can see where it could be. On the other hand, it sounds to me like you just need to get back inside the head of your own character and find out what that journey really is. Have date night. Okay. Date night with your character. All right, we got about seven minutes left, so I'm going to line up one, maybe two more questions, depending on the answer. So. Well, it's not necessarily a question. It was a comparison about <coughs> <that's> <coughs> from a strong female. Harry Potter, to me, is a classic example. Granted, it was Harry Potter's story, but I always thought Hermione complimented Harry because she had the wits. She may not have the strength, she had the wits to figure out problems. He had the heart. You know, and he all, to me, he was always a weak guy. He always had somebody to push him in the right direction. So trying to find the weak male character, he was the protagonist. But honestly, I think if it wasn't for Hermione, Harry would do half the same. I agree with that. That's a good comment. I think that Harry went kicking and screaming a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. He, he had to pull his hair most of the time. Somebody gave him to do it in the right direction. He would have failed until the end. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah she, she was the one who made him practice out of his heart. Like, like, without. There would have been a lot of failure. I the never would have put him in the room, man. He would have died. It would, right? The story would have gone a lot shorter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So real quick, I just want to remind everybody when the panel ends, we're going to exit through the end, the back door. I'm going to ask our panelists if they would just take a couple of minutes real quick. And um, since we do have a lot of writers in the room, just to give a quick bit of, of advice in regards to writing, you know, what, what's the core element here to writing a female hero? Well, obviously get your butt in the chair and write. That's, that's going to be your key. Um, if you can't write, do anything else, commit to 100 words a day. You know that's a, that's like one or two paragraphs. Anybody can do that. 
Uh, the other thing I would say is make that person human. I don't care if she's you know a woman, a male, a, a polar bear. A, you know, make that make that character as human as you can make that character, or as real as real as you can make that character. Make sure that you give them lots of strengths and lots of flaws. I had a an author friend who writes picture books. He describes it this way. He says, I built this big scaffolding and then I put my protagonist up at the top and then I start pulling out the blocks so they can't get down. I take away the ladders, I pull out the blocks, and that, that protagonist has to get back down off that tower. And so make sure that you're putting lots of, uh, throwing lots of, and then, he, and he says, then I throw rocks at the character while they're trying to climb down. Throw a lot of rocks, throw a lot of sticks, uh, love them a soft one once in a while, but, you know, temper that character. Temper them, give, you know, make sure that they are that sword that they need to be by the end of the story. Jen? <coughs> um, pay attention to people. Um, and I think that that's the a strong woman in your life, pay attention to what makes her strong, what makes the women in your life, makes you feel like they're they're awesome. And it might not be that they're a sword fighter, gun fighter, awesome assassin. It might be that they're willing to stand up for something in a quiet way. <laughs> okay. So I would like to thank our panelists today, uh, Sharon Stewart. Thank you all for coming and have a great rest of the con. Thank you.